Obviously, controversial topics are not foreign to the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm used to engaging with topics of religious, spiritual, and sexual abuse, topics that don't usually make for great conversation at the Thanksgiving dinner table. But if there's one topic that might be the most divisive, it's politics. And that's exactly what we're diving into today. Today, I'm sitting down with Kristen Dumay. She is the professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University. She holds a PhD from the University of Notre Dame and her research focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics. She's written for the Washington Post, Religion News Service, Christianity Today, Christian Century, and Religion and Politics, and has been interviewed on NPR, CTV, the CBC, and by CNN, the New York Times, The Economist, The Christian Post, PBS NewsHour, and the Associated Press, among other outlets. And you can find her on Patheos with the blog Anxious Bench. Her most recent book is Jesus and John Wayne. How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. With a title like that, you know this is going to be an interesting conversation. Let's get into it right now on the Preacher Boys podcast. I would like to thank the evangelical and religious community because I'll tell you what, the support that they've given me, and I'm not sure I totally deserve it, has been so amazing and has had such a big reason for me being here tonight. We have a threefold primary responsibility. Number one, get people saved. Number two, get them baptized. Number three, get them registered to vote. We're not electing a pastor in chief. We're electing a commander in chief. I want you to be able to see what what that is. I don't know if you can tell what that is or not, but, but that's what he gave me. And he said, if uh, the crowd don't get with you, you just pull that out of your pocket, wave it a while, and they'll get with you. Yeah. Thank God for the South. Yeah. Long, live, long live the memory of Stonewall Jackson. Amen, friend. Amen. Everybody okay? Amen. You know, one of the things I found out about West Coast Baptist College and this church is there's this not a safe space. So the snowflakes uh, do not, you know, if you're a snowflake, you don't want to come here. And uh, so we posted some pictures of, of all of us eating that delicious uh, Chick-fil-A. And I think we sparked microaggressions from coast to coast. Amen. I don't want some meek and mild leader or somebody who's going to turn the other cheek. I've said I want the meanest, toughest SOB I can find to protect this nation. Watch what Pedo Joe and his hoe, Kamala Harris, literal whore, a filthy, stinking, dirty, literal whore. Now, we got to be armed, and we got to be dangerous. And half of y'all and all these people want to know if it's loaded. Go to sleep and find out, choir. If we don't go vote by default, we've chosen death. I don't want a nice guy as a president. I want someone that will stand up for America. There are a lot of things about Donald Trump that I don't like. But there's one thing that we can't argue. He has been a friend to the church of God, a friend to the people of God. He has not hurt us one bit. He has helped us and he has stood on principles of life, principles of godliness in certain aspects of our way in those moments right there. My dad raised a man. I'll look you in the face and said, you're all Democrat. And one reason y'all are listening to a Democratic governor and shutting us down because you're a Democrat and you don't like what's going on. I want you to know this man, Congressman Pence, described himself as a Christian conservative and Republican in that order. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm so excited to have Kristen on the show with us today. Uh, your book was really high on my list uh, for a long time, and uh, someone had recommended. And when they said the title, Jesus and John Wayne, I was like, I have to pick up this book immediately. And I'm glad they recommended it. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And since the book was written, there's been a lot of developments that uh, you know probably could have been included. You've got Falwell Jr. with Liberty U. You've got, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. You've got Donald Trump, you know, losing the election. Uh, But in a strange way, a lot of what you wrote in the book was confirmed for better or for worse with 2020 and a lot of the events that have happened. So I really wanted to, you know, talk with you and kind of cover some of that. But before we do that, uh, what got you interested in this topic and kind of pushed you to like address politics and Christianity? 
it's actually my students' fault. So I'm a professor at Calvin University, and more than 15 years ago, uh, students came up to me after class. I had just finished a lecture on Teddy Roosevelt in early 20th century history, and I thought it was a great way to show them how gender worked and ideas of masculinity could be linked to foreign policy and to economic shifts and, and to uh, questions of power. And I just thought it was a great little, little lecture I just gave. And after that class, a couple of guys came up to me and said, Professor Dumay, there's this book you really have to read. And that book was John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. And I opened that book up, this is around 2005, 2006. And so the, the book was published in 2001. And, and sure enough, right, right at the beginning was a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. And I, I went on to see that it was just a very um, militant, militaristic conception of you know, Christian manhood. And uh, at that time, we are just uh, enmeshed in the Iraq war, and I was looking at all the survey data coming out showing how white evangelicals were disproportionately you know, militaristic, supporting the Iraq war, supporting preemptive war in general, condoning the use of torture. And so right at that moment, I started asking the, these questions of how do conceptions of masculinity and gender, uh, and how are they connected to broader political ideas? Ideas, not just with you know kind of cultural values and domestic politics but also foreign policy and if they ever come over the Chinese ever come over and by the way they outnumber us like crazy if they ever land on our shores you can't video game them away and if you think pulling the trigger is the same as playing a video game brother Marshall is it anything like that at all no because you're fixing to take a life there's a whole lot more to it than just putting on goggles in a virtual reality. You can't even handle life. Let them come over and take our country and you guys will run for the hills. Um, so anyway, I, I started the research project back then. I ended up setting aside for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I wasn't uh, in, it wasn't, first of all, what I was finding was incredibly disturbing. I mean, it was right. really, really disturbing. And as a Christian myself, I just thought, do I really wanna go into these dark spaces? Um, and related to that, it wasn't clear to me how fringe this all was, right? Is this, is this mainstream and does it really warrant this, this kind of spotlight that, that a book would, would, would put on it? Or is this really still a fringe movement? And, and I just wasn't quite sure. And I was busy with other things. I set it aside and it was the fall of 2016 actually the week after the Access Hollywood tape uh, released that I ended up thinking, yeah, yeah, this is, this is more mainstream than, than I had anticipated. And I dusted off that old research and ended up writing this book. Right. Yeah. I think the election was a shock for everybody on both sides. And, um, you know, it was, you said it, you were wondering if it was fringe or not. And I mean, eight, you, you mentioned one of your, uh, in one of your lectures that it was eight out of 10 evangelicals were in support of Donald Trump. That's far from being fringe. Right. Um, and, and so uh, your initial kind of work on this was the article in Religion and Politics, where you focused in on militant evangelical masculinity. Um, can you just define what you mean when you're saying militant evangelical Christianity? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's not really all that specialized. It's uh, a, a kind of a militant conception of uh, the Christian faith needs to be defended, right? It needs, it is under threat, it is under siege, and it needs to be defended through kind of earthly power. I've always thought if more, if more good people had concealed carry permits, then we could end those Muslims before they, before they walk in and kill them. So, so I, I just want to, I just wanted to take this opportunity to encourage all of you to get your permit. We offer a free course, and let's, let's, let's teach them a lesson if they ever show up here. So. Uh, on uh, the foreign policy front, uh, this, this really developed during the Cold War era, where it was very specifically a military defense, right? It was a military threat. And so Christian America needed to be defended through, through uh, brute force uh, and through the U.S. military. Uh, but then there's also this conception of like 
Christianity itself, the well-being of the Christian church in America and evangelicals as the most faithful remnant really needed to be militant about defending their faith against threats internal as well, against uh, not just communism externally, but uh, secular humanism liberalism, feminism, lots of isms come along, and, and that it needed to be to militantly defend its, its own truth and its power in order to preserve that truth and to defend the nation. And so when you, when you did the article, obviously it, it exploded, like it, it got a lot of attention. Um, was that kind of what triggered you to say like, there's more to write here. There's obviously a lot of attention here. Or was the book already something you were thinking, I should probably do more than, you know, just the singular article? You know, when I first kind of put this together in the fall of 2016 and, and just around, you know, Access Hollywood w- tape released just a month before the election. And so it was all kind of of the same moment to me. And uh, at that, it, w- it was at that point that this, this whole project kind of crystallized. I, I, I'm not sure that I had made the leap that this needs to be a book yet, but I knew I needed to put this together. I had all this research from 15 years earlier and I, I, I did pull it out and, and I just knew it, it explained a lot. I, I, I've never felt so sure about a project. I didn't mm-hmm. know what the scope of the project would be, um, but I knew I needed to, I needed to bring this together. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I think it was it was really the the reception of that article, where um, which tracked very closely to the research and writing I had already done. Um, but it, I could see it didn't just resonate with me; it resonated with tens of thousands of readers. And what was really interesting to me too were the comments that that article um, drew, in, including so many comments from white evangelical men themselves, mm. saying yes, this, you know, you've got this exactly right. And I hadn't anticipated that kind of feedback uh, from that particular community. And I think that also really uh, prompted me to, um, uh, to turn it into a book. Uh, there was so much more I knew that needed to be uh, developed, that needed to be uncovered. I just had done a little slice of that history, but I knew there was a much larger story there. Were you kind of, I mean, obviously the subtitle of your book is how white evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation. So you're not pulling punches like from the cover onward. Um, was, was there any hesitation, especially as a female author who were, when women are usually in the crosshairs of the most militant sects of Christianity, um, were you concerned or hesitant about like how this would be received? I know you had some, some private support and letters from evangelicals, but were you worried about what this would mean for you on the on the grand scale i'm not sure if worried i I was aware (laughs) i was i was wary maybe that's that's i didn't lose a lot of sleep over it Mm -hmm. uh but no i didn't pull any punches here and that was a decision that i made early on it as i was researching uh i was horrified by what i was reading to be honest i uh and i was angry i was very angry again as a as a person of faith myself seeing what harm these teachings have done to women, to children, uh, and honestly to this country. Um, but I, I was angry as, as I was researching. And more importantly, I saw the patterns of, um, of what, uh, of how this, these abuses were perpetuated in so many instances. And these abuses were, were able to, um, to persist for so long because the community around, around the perpetrators uh, deferred to their authority. Mm-hmm. Right? There was so much deference shown to the authority of leaders, even and especially when they were abusive leaders. And we see that in churches, we see that in organizations, we see that in families. And once I, once I discerned that pattern, I, I think at that point I decided I will not show deference or I'm not going to show deference to abusers of power. And I wanted to be very clear. Uh, I think the tone of the book makes that clear. The subtitle makes it clear. And, and that was important to me. And, um, and, and I think that explains uh, part of what's, what's going on. Um, was I worried about what that would mean? I mean, yes, I was warned. I was warned by my publisher uh, or my publisher's lawyer to expect to be um, viciously trolled. 
Uh, I was given advice for how to kind of lock things down. Um, I'm very happy to report that there's been some mild trolling here and there, but far and away the reception of this book uh, inside and outside evangelical circles has been incredibly enthusiastic. So I now have hundreds and hundreds of letters from evangelicals themselves just saying thank you. And mm -hmm. I did not anticipate that. So yes, I was worried, but uh, my fears did not come to pass. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, I remember you mentioned a letter in one of the the lectures you had you'd done, and um, someone said, "Oh, what's the? Why make a big deal about these sorts of topics if if people are coming to Jesus? You know, then it's fine." And and I remember the letter said, "You know, well, which Jesus? You know?" And it was you used a used an image of like a very muscular Christ and like an American flag, and like it, it raised an interesting question: is like what is and I, I wrestled with this coming out of the independent Baptist movement. I wrestled with what is my faith? Like, is it largely political? What does Jesus look like? Is God just angry at me all the time? Like, what what does this look like? Um, and, you know, a lot of it was, it was very much in the realm of, you know, self-improvement, becoming a better man, becoming a strong, you know, we used to go to a conference called Master's Men every year where, you know, all the guys go together and, you know, make these decisions. and. Um, you, you really start your book in the beginning of the 1900s, kind of the attack on like feminized Christianity. Like it, faith was something that it wasn't polling well with men for lack of a better word. And so you saw the rise of people like Billy Sunday, you know, Billy Graham kind of rise in the forefront. Um, you know, is that where you feel like this kind of modern Christianity really has its roots? Is that that recently? Well, yes and no. I mean, if you take the, the long view of Christian history, uh, I think even more than masculinity, the, the question at the heart of this book is the relationship between Christianity and power. And power is often expressed through masculinity. Um, and, and so that's where the masculinity comes in. But it really is, you know, what is the relationship between Christianity and power? And there in the history of the Christian church, you can see, you know, there's a long history of Christians grasping power. Right. Uh, and, and, and so you can find continuity if you're looking for it. But as a historian, I will also say you have to be attentive to change over time. Yeah. Uh, that that there is a lot of variation as well within any Christian in any moment in Christian history, and then again across time. And so, one of the key problems for me was where do I start this book? <laughs> where, where? How far back do I need to go? Do we go to the Crusades? How far? Exactly, how far? Are we exactly. Yeah. And you know, like I, I do I start in the 1970s? No, no. I, I for sure need the 1940s, but I can't really start in the 1940s, right? Because you have the muscular Christianity that comes in the early 20th century. But then I also wanted to show that that itself is a change from what came before. It was a change from you know what we see in the 19th century, especially Victorian Christianity. But then you have what's going on in the American South with, you know, which looks a little bit more familiar. So, so the whole point of that introduction or the first chapter really is to show that things have not always looked the way they do now. Things have not always been the same. And so, yes, you can find earlier iterations of a muscular Christianity. Um, and yes, you can find a longer tradition of Christian nationalism. But Christian nationalism and kind of muscular Christianity and conservative Protestantism did not always align together. Uh, in fact, they often did not. Uh, and that's where it was interesting to me to look into the history around the First World War, where, yeah, you've got a Billy Sunday, you know, who's militant and conservative Protestant and, you know, it looks very familiar to us. Uh, but you had a lot of conservative Protestants who were not embracing militarism, who were ambivalent about the war, who were not Christian nationalists, right? They were mm -hmm. separatists. You had a lot of liberal Protestants who were gung-ho military and muscular Christianity, right? And so you have all these different kind of arrangements. And it really is in the 1940s that we see the alignments come into place that we recognize today with conservative evangelicals being uh, very patriotic, militaristic, and uh, really locating this gender traditionalism at the core of their religious and political identities. Right. Yeah. You um, you, you go back a little bit before the 1900s when you when you talk about you know you use the term a few times here about ca cowboy Christianity. You know you you kind of throw phrases similar to that, and what really 
the first few times you make mention, I was like, what does that mean? Like what, like I I can picture it. I can picture, it's like hearing Jesus and John Wayne. You you know exactly what it is, but you also are like, what is this about? And uh, you make a, you made a statement in chapter one that I thought was interesting where you said, um, you know, on the frontier, white men brought order to savagery. And to me, that was where the entire book clicked into gear for me, as far as understanding, like, Everything we've seen from the early 1900s through now at a, a boiling point with, uh, you know, the election cycle that we're stuck in right now is white men in power trying to bring order to what they deem to be total savagery, uh, savagery you know, fake news media, um, you know, the war on drugs, if you want to go back to the 80s, like there's time and time again, you see these white political leaders and Christian leaders trying to do this stuff. Um, And uh, can you just kind of talk about some of the people who led that charge throughout history? I mean, obviously we mentioned Billy Sunday, Uh, Jack Hiles is massive within the circle that I was in. I mean, really kind of kicked off the independent Baptist movement. Like who do you think were kind of the, the big pushers and movers there? Oh yes, yes. The bringing order, uh, you know, to savagery, and 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 this is this is kind of at the heart of this militancy, right? Because the stakes are always incredibly high, mm-hmm. and the idea is that, um, right, we have God on our side. God is on our side, so righteousness is on our side. Therefore, the ends will always uh, justify the means because we are on God's side, uh, right? So that's where violence comes in. You can use violence in order to bring order right in fact in fact you should and yeah. men should that's what god gave men testosterone for that's why god made men aggressive and strong so you better use your gifts to do god's will and to, to fulfill your duty right this is this is kind of the framework uh so so who are some of the the leading proponents of this uh I mean, it's just such common rhetoric. Uh, so Jerry Falwell Sr., uh, very, very important in kind of wedding this militarism. And for him, it was very pro-military um, and bringing this, this militaristic rhetoric into Christianity, into his conception of you know, spirituality, of faithfulness uh, into the church. Um, so he played a really critical role. And then, of course, he, he really... Um, um, did this within the walls of his own church, Thomas Road Baptist Church, but then uh, through the moral majority, through his media presence and platform, he really then exported this throughout the country uh, and, and really helped shape the moral majority around this, this kind of militancy at its heart. So Jerry Falwell Sr., um, really critical there. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon said, living by God's principles, promotes a nation to greatness. Violating those principles brings a nation to shame. That's the Proverbs, chapter 14 and verse 34. I strongly believe what Solomon said. Our founding fathers were not all saints. Nobody ever accused Thomas Jefferson of being a fundamental Baptist. And uh, Benjamin Franklin and all the rest But without question, again, they were men very much influenced by the Judeo-Christian principles laid down by the early Puritans and pilgrims and religious people who came here seeking religious freedom. Uh, But you're right, Jack Hiles and many kind of lesser lights within uh, uh, fundamental Baptist churches, within uh, conservative evangelical or just fundamentalist churches, all kind of use this rhetoric. And, and what I saw is it, it worked very well uh, within the local church because um, there you can, uh, it, this, this again, this us versus them mentality and, and this like that, that we hold the truth. That wasn't just like a collective we. It, sometimes it was a very specific we in this church, yeah. this local church are the source of truth. So don't go to the church down the road, right? Right. That's where that's deceit. Um, Don't trust anybody, but in this local congregation, meaning the pastor, essentially, who, who has the power over the congregation and maybe the elders, but, but the authority again is very hierarchical. And, and then that rhetoric ends up really bolstering the authority of, 
of the pastor, of the leader, um, and the fears that are instilled in the hearts of, of the, the members of the church, of the community. I mean, I saw that over and over again in, in independent fundamental Baptist churches. This is, yeah. this is very common, right? That, that members themselves really do come to believe that uh, it is a very scary world on the mm -hmm. other side and outside of these walls and outside of this church, right? That, that is where evil lurks. Yeah. And so you need to defend and you need to bolster against that evil. Um, so, so, I mean, you've got national leaders who are saying this, but you see this very much repeated at the local level as well. And people mm -hmm. genuinely believing that, again, the world is a very scary place. And therefore, again, the ends will justify the means. The Bible says that there's 7,000 haven't, haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And today, it seems like we're getting closer and closer to an actual 7,000. Oh, yeah, actual 7,000. Right, and I'm going to tell you something right here. At Independent Baptist Church, right here in Port Ritchie, Florida, we will not bow the knee to BLM. We will not bow the knee to the Democrats. We will not bow the knee to the Southern Baptist Convention, no. uh, whose president uh, uh, allows abortion practitioners in his church. Yeah, no, I can resonate with that. I mean, growing up in independent Baptist circles, it was very much, this is the church. Like our local body yeah. could be the thing standing in the gap. You know, they used to yeah. say that, are you going to stand in the gap? That was a common sermon theme. You go to conferences and it was a larger scale, but it was, the, the Southern Baptist Convention is already liberal. They've already lost the battle. Like they're gone. So now it's just the independent Baptist churches and there's not many of us, but we're going to stand in the gap. That was common, uh, a common phrase. You, you, you talked about it. And, and I, I really resonated with in the book, like you talking about that mentality of like being this, like everything outside of us is dangerous. Like everything we can't engage with. Like we need to be like proactively combating because it's going to take us over. Um, you, you, you kind of referred to him as like an embattled remnant. That was the phrase that you used. I thought was interesting. And um, one thing that that's really kind of helped me when with reading the book is I've, I've been reading a lot from Stephen Hassan, who is a, a cult expert. And um, he talks a lot about when a group preaches a lot about being persecuted and then they're rejected from the mainstream, like so many of these churches were uh, that were more fundamentalist. It just further makes them hunker down in that position and say like, oh, we're right. So when an independent Baptist church is losing elections or when they are, um, you know, getting laughed at by a convention or when they're, you know, being for ridiculous ideology are being, you know, called to the mats for it. For them, that's an approval that they're being holier than everybody else. And it, it's interesting seeing that, that mentality now for someone who grew up outside of that world, now seeing it with like, oh, the moral majority was that at scale. Like that's exactly what it was. Um, exactly. So it's very hard to combat, right? It, it, right? It's very hard because you're you're likely to just by pushing back further radicalize people within these communities. It's just all the more evidence that see, we told you, right? You can't trust people on the outside, and they are out to get us, and they're disrespecting us, right? They're right. ridiculing us. We don't, you know, we don't have the respect that we deserve or that our ideas deserve, and 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 we never have enough power, right? Because if if we if we are the faithful remnant. And we have such an important role to play in the history of Christianity, right? Because America has such an important role to play in the history of Christianity. And, and we're the faithful remnant left in America right now. Again, the stakes are just so incredibly high. And so you have this, this kind of um, persecution uh, uh, kind of narrative that, that persists even when um, groups are not particularly marginalized. So you can, you can talk about, you know, maybe um, more extreme sects or, uh, you know, uh, denominations being still, you know, fairly marginalized or fairly fringe or just small. But if you look at, say, you know, white evangelicalism, generally, it's, it's kind of hard to make the, the case that, that the movement is widely persecuted. And yet um, that perception still holds true to many people within the movement um, and that they're, they're able to hold that together with their, you know, sense of cultural importance and cultural influence. Um, what was really interesting to me is I saw historically how this uh, sense of embattlement really tend to tended to strengthen 
during uh, democratic administration. So when they felt really furthest from um, the, the centers of political power. Um, and when, when their party, the Republican party was out. Um, and that's when you saw the, a lot of the, the power really kind of strengthening in this movement, um, especially the political power. Uh, whereas when you when Republicans were in the White House, traditionally, that's when you saw a lot of the organizations kind of fold because the donations dried up and and they, they didn't really have a common enemy. And and so that was an interesting pattern to observe. And all that changed uh, these last four years. And that was really remarkable to me to see that that President Trump had this way of but maintaining, even as he, you know, assured uh, conservative evangelicals that he would grant them special privileges and protection still had this way to to gin up the fear and this um, persecution complex. And I think that ability of his was really key to um, per maintaining the, the high level of loyalty and support among so many in, in this religious community. Well, he started even so small. I mean, the, one of the earliest things that he got evangelicals riled up about was like, the idea that we couldn't say Merry Christmas, you know? I mean, he started literally at the grassroots. And I remember visiting back to churches that I had grown up around just to see friends or family. And the pastors would be using that same rhetoric saying like, oh, I went to Walmart. They said, happy holidays. And like, they would act as if this was this crazy <laughs> situation. And, you know, but but it's it's this thing that really fueled like evangelicals to, to pursue a couple of things. Like you mentioned the book, like, there's a period where it looks like there's almost silence in the evangelical community, but you make clear they were putting together colleges, institutions, yeah. printing presses, like they were going to work to build a foundation for what we see now. Yeah. Um, but, but also it kind of fuels, you know, we see the most popular fundamentalist family in America, the Duggars, like you see the, the quiverful movement coming in. You see all of these different ways of just saying like, how do we increase our numbers, increase our influence, increase our ability to, take power. Um, so kind of, kind of talking through the political push, uh, you know, the idea of America being a Christian nation, you know, is it's, it, that's an interesting history because every historian, every person you talk to will say it absolutely wasn't, it became branded as that it was, but it wasn't perfect. Um, but the Christian nation, as we see it now, you really point to the times of like Truman, Eisenhower, like yeah. that's the names you keep saying. Why is that kind of where you you zero in is like that that rebrand happening? Yeah, I, it's so. I mean, people mean different things by you know what does it mean to be a Christian nation, and what evangelicals often mean is uh, you know, suggesting that our founding fathers were essentially essentially proto evangelicals, right? They're mm -hmm. faithful men who look a lot like uh, evangelicals today. And of course, historically, that does not hold much water. <laughs> right. um, but also there's this, this notion that um, uh, Christian America, that America is, is somehow divinely chosen, the second Israel and, and is God's favored nation. And, and then this idea that uh, therefore, you know, what America does is, is, is righteous. And, and this is where I, I, I would like to point out that the idea of America as a Christian nation is a distinctively white religious ideal. Mm. Um, for the most part, uh, if you just think about the narrative of, you know, America was founded as a Christian nation, blessed by God and, and you know, just pursued righteousness and everything was going really well until the 1960s, right? And then things right. fell apart. If you think about it, that really only makes sense if you are a white Christian, uh, yeah. that narrative. It's inherently um, and, sexist, that, that the time too. period that it that changes. Too. Is, yeah. <laughs> Right. But especially for black Protestants, right? That narrative makes utterly no sense, but that's something that is, is not um, readily apparent to white Christians who, who tend to think, you know, that this is just uh, history. This is just Christianity and there's well, and nothing. Ones who do discuss it. Uh, you mentioned Douglas Wilson. Douglas Wilson would say that it was a Christian nation in spite of slavery and the civil war should never have happened. You know, right. That you, yeah. Right. So. In spite, or maybe even because of slavery, if you want to push it further, right. With, with mm -hmm. Wilson, depending, uh, which paragraph you read of his. Yes. Uh, so, so race is, is a part of this. 
so then in the in the 1940s, 1950s, this is the Cold War context, right, where Christian America it comes to be kind of part of, of American identity. And, and you've got, uh, you know, the communists, this great threat to all that is good. And communists were anti-God anti-family and anti-America. And thus, you know, the flip side was all that was was lovely and good and needed to be protected. This is also the time when we see evangelicals coming together, banding together to assert their influence. And you're exactly right. In the 1930s and early 40s, right, evangelicals didn't totally disappear after the Scopes trial in the 1920s. Uh, they just didn't maintain control of certain large denominations, but that didn't stop them. They started their own denominations. They started their own independent churches. They started their Bible institutes and, and you know, across the country. And it was in the early 40s that they came together and said, okay, we're doing all of these amazing things. Just think what we could do if we band together. Mm. And, and they had a plan, right, in the, early, in the early 40s with the National Association of Evangelicals. They knew what they wanted to do. Yeah. They said, we need organizations that are going to link all of these, these institutions. And we need magazines with tens of thousands of subscribers. And we need radio. And then very soon after that, we need television, right, to reach into all of the corners of this country. And they did exactly that. It's really uncanny if you kind of look at their plans. And then with the help of Billy Graham and, and everything he was able to, to pull together, they, they achieved this. Um, and so this was uh, in the 1950s that we see this coming together. And somewhat stunningly, already by the 1950s, and with the help of Billy Graham, conservative evangelicals are wielding power on the national stage in the White House with Eisenhower. And, and so very quickly, they, they moved to the center of things um, from a feeling like they were on the fringes, you know, post scopes trial, that they were kind of um, just scattered. Then they made these plans and then within 10 years, look at them. It was amazing. Um, and then if that 1950s is where you, you kind of uh, start, then you can see how by the 1960s and by the 1970s, they feel re-marginalized. They mm -hmm. feel like they are no longer at the center of things. This consensus moment has kind of started to unravel. The consensus was only ever with certain white middle class right, Americans, mm -hmm. not, not a whole consensus. But uh, you can see where their, their sense of displacement came from. But that's a very short historical framework um, to be working from. Oh. But that's where the sense of nostalgia tends to go back to, right? We want those days again, or what we think those days were like. Yeah, the Billy Graham crusade. And and to the credit, I mean, like, you know, as it's a it's a mixed thing, right? I mean, as as a Christian, you're saying like, okay, there's so much that was accomplished that, you know, would not have been, a, you know, that at a large scale, that was incredible, but it was a Trojan horse for so many horrific things that we didn't see. And so, you know, you look at, you know, the Billy, you know, Billy Graham crusades, and you're going like, well, it's amazing you had a platform like that, but what yeah. that devolved into and what the term, you know, the, I mean, just look at all of the things connected now with that name and all the baggage associated with Franklin Graham. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's a strange thing and it's strange, especially as a Christian to look at it and recognize like, okay, there was a lot of good, but like, what did this mean for women, for African-Americans? And that's where it seems like the two factions of evangelical world kind of fell apart was like the 60s and 70s um yeah. you, you kind of said like the uh Amer well i called america into question but vietnam and yeah. civil rights um can you just talk about the response to those two things and how that kind of further you know enforced what christians were already saying and, and speaking about yeah, so the, the 1960s uh, was this time of kind of unraveling and for, for the, the country as a whole, uh, not just for American evangelicals, but American evangelicals felt it perhaps most keenly because the values that they, they clung to most fiercely, this kind of gender traditionalism and you know, patriotism, militarism, uh, they, they were really um, you know, no longer consensus values. Uh, and the civil rights movement is an, a really important backdrop here. When we just talk American evangelicalism, we tend to forget that, you know, the importance of the American South 
in, in terms of who we're actually talking about. Many, many evangelicals are Southerners. Uh, and so the civil rights movement is absolutely disrupting the status quo, the order of society in the American South in the 1950s and 1960s. And um, so that's who we're talking about. And then uh, if you follow the work of other historians who have traced kind of migration patterns, we see a lot of Southern evangelicals during the post-war era end up moving out to Southern California, to the Sun Belt, to Orange County, which right. will go on and play a really important role in, uh, in the formation of the, the religious right, the modern political right. Right. So you can see this, the, the Southern identity and the Southern value system uh, with patriarchy and racism are, are very much a part of the DNA of modern American evangelicalism. And that's something that I think Northern evangelicals don't always appreciate, uh, that, uh, that this is very much a part of the, the religion and the culture that they too have embraced uh, mm. over time. Uh, so you have the, the backdrop of the civil rights movement, and then you have a lot of opposition to uh, desegregation efforts. That was something I worked to point out in this book, that uh, issues like um, parental authority, like um, anti-government, right? Get the federal government out of my family. The parents ought to have full authority over their children. You must put that in its historical context of uh, anti or of, of anti desegregationism, trying to maintain right. segregated schools. Uh, many white flight academies, Christian schools were started right during this time. And so parental authority is not racially neutral mm -hmm. and it never meant to apply, say, to the authority of black parents to make choices for their children. Uh, and then you have the Vietnam War. And I was not expecting when I started this research to um, just the significance of the Vietnam War in really shaping evangelical identity. Uh, the war was just so profound and so disruptive and so disappointing, I think, to, to many Americans and, and to many conservatives who firmly believed in American power and in American goodness and righteousness. And the reports coming back from uh, Vietnam were disrupting all of those values that American men somehow were unable to defeat this ragtag enemy of North yeah. Vietnamese. So what was wrong with American manhood? And then reports of atrocities being committed. So, you know, maybe we weren't the, the you know, the, this benevolent power. Maybe we weren't. Uh, the source of all righteousness on the global right. stage, and many are maybe our 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 soldiers weren't, and and so that was something that many Americans came to question militarism, came to question American power on the global stage, um, but that's this moment when evangelicals, conservative evangelicals, double down on these values. Um, they, they really kind of recommit to the U.S. military, bolster their authority, and, um, and proclaim the righteousness of American power. And it's at that point that this emerges as a distinctive, right? In, in the 1940s and 1950s Cold War, their values were, were pretty closely aligned with the values of many Americans, regardless of their religious orientation. By the 1960s, that, that begins to change, and certainly by the 1970s, it's clear that these values of militarism, patriarchy, uh, and in, in some cases, uh, racism, are their distinctives, mm -hmm. what sets them apart from many other Americans. Right. Yeah, you, um, you mentioned the very, it's funny that you said, like, going to it, you know, you didn't expect to be talking about Vietnam, but Vietnam is such a big, like that period of time is so crazy to me. And, and honestly, it's, for me, it's the seventies and eighties that are just mind blowing. Like, like the, the connections of, of Graham to you know, Nixon, the, the um, Barry Goldwater's quote. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. For me, in, in my context, like I was, I was a child when the Iraq War 
started. Yeah. But like reading about Vietnam and, and reading about the situation at that time, you could take all of those statements and place them in that context. And what was being said from, I mean, now I'm like researching from, from the pulpit side, like the things that were being said were the same thing. Yeah. It was, it was this, if we don't take them out, they're going to come take our churches. They're going to take our school. If we let the government get too much power. I, um, I, I used, I used to go to a Christian school. I was a staff kid, you know, there, yeah. and we're going to lose our accreditation. They're going to yeah. mandate vaccines. They're going to fill in the blank with all of these different things. And it's just crazy. But re- reading through segregation, like Jerry Falwell preaching against, you know, pastors who are speaking out on civil rights, but then asking for civil disobedience in the eighties when uh, (laughs) women might be involved in the draft. It's like, this stuff is so cyclical. And the fact that I can recognize that stuff now as still going on is just insane to me. Um, So um, obviously like, and we could spend a lot of time on segregation. I mean, Bob Jones University, uh, you mm-hmm. mentioned they didn't admit African-Americans till 71. They had, they still had to get a permission slip signed up till 2000 to be able to date someone of another race. Um, Paul Chapel, West Coast, it was 2001. He was sending out memos saying avoid exotic relationships. Like it's just super, super strange things. Again, all harkening back to this 1950s, you know, cultural Christianity. We stand against the one world government against the coming world of Antichrist, which is a one world system, a blending of all differences, a blending of national differences, economic differences, church differences, into a big one ecumenical world. Okay, the Bible's very clear about this. We said, you know, way back years ago when we first had a problem, which was, by the way, we started this principle back in the mid-50s. I was a college student at BJU at the time, and it was with an Asian and Caucasian is we didn't even have black students for another 15 years. So it was not put there as a black thing. I think well, people so need to understand that. the fear of one world relates back to two people dating? Yeah. We realize that an interracial marriage is not going to bring in the world the Antichrist by any means. But if we as Christians stand for Christ and not Antichrist, and we see, you know, we're against the one world church. We're against uh, uh, one economy one political system. We see what the Bible says about this. So we say, okay, if they're going to blend this world and interracial marriage is a genetic blending, which is a very definite sort of blending, we said, as, let's put this policy in here because we're against the one world church. But kind of going toward the dominion side, because you focus so heavily on Christian dominionism and like really just taking over. Um, you, you mentioned three names. You mentioned... Uh, you mentioned James Dobson, Jerry Falwell, uh, which we've talked about, and Tim LaHaye. Uh, Tim LaHaye obviously wrote Left Behind. It's uh, almost every American's read it, 65 million. You can't go into a Goodwill without seeing you know, 25,000 copies. Um, what role do you think like, the premillennial eschatology plays in like, the political ideology? Because I have, to say, I have to venture and say it's a big part of it. Um, but how much of a connection is there? Oh, yeah. You know, I think it's, it's the, the premillennialism is there. The, um, you know, I thought you're going to go down the Rush Dooney uh, road there for a little bit too, in in terms of these deeper influences uh, and uh, the the importance of presuppositionalism uh, Mm -hmm. linked to Christian reconstructionism and dominionism, right? That you have all of these deep roots and um, I, I think they are, they are formative. What I also came away with uh, by, uh, through this research was that over time, these theological uh, uh, kind of sources for uh, much of this ideology became less significant. And it's more the fruits <laughs> that were, you know, where it led, that were the unifying principles. So over time, whether you're a pre-millennialist or a post-millennialist wasn't that important anymore. Um, To a few theology professors and pastors, it might be. um, But for most, it really diminished in significance. And what emerged as the really the unifying forces within within and across conservative evangelicalism came to be kind of the applications of these teachings. So the, the cultural issues, and particularly around gender. And so if you are going to be upholding patriarchy, 
uh, how you get there, whether it's as a pre-millennialist or a post-millennialist, we don't really care all that much, but we know you're on our side. And that, that, that was really interesting to me to, to see like uh, the, the kind of boundaries shift that things that were once really important diminish greatly in significance, whereas other things really, really rose to the, the uh, top. And this is also the case that um, what is really important to pastors and theologians is not always important to people in the pews. Mm -hmm. And that's something that came through very clearly over the course of this research. So I'm a cultural historian and I, and I looked at really the consumption of religious products. Um, this popular religious culture. So yes, Tim LaHaye's books, absolutely. James Dobson's focus on the family radio shows. And, you know, on the one hand, you do have the theologians off at the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood and in the, you know, the SBC and within local churches. Um, and their theology is very important to them. And it does influence the, the popular culture, but not as much as we might think. And then on the other hand, you have the consumers of these cultural products, right? And, and many of them are, are pretty much theologically illiterate, to be honest. Um, and forget about premillennialism or postmillennialism or, you know, uh, doctrines of the atonement, like just, just basic religious illiteracy. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not religious, hmm. right? That for them, it's this cultural identity, uh, and a cultural identity that is built around gender ideals, around ideas of Christian nationalism, right? That this has come to really define the center of their faith. And so that's a shift that I trace in this mm -hmm. book. And I think that's something that I've done in this book that is disruptive to maybe traditional histories of evangelicalism, that we need to change our understanding of what evangelicalism comes to mean to evangelicals themselves who um, live in, in a consumer culture, um, what has actually formed their values, what has actually shaped their faith. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's me you do really well in the book. And, and, you know, I mentioned not pulling any punches, but I think you also, uh, one thing I was, I was, while politically, I think I would line up very similarly to where I would assume that, that you're at. I, I think that um, you do a really good job of not wearing that on your sleeve. And I think you ad address these things very intellectually and not emotionally. And I, th I think that's where most, again, it goes back to pushing people back into their boxes. Mm -hmm. I, I think the way that you talk about it, like even, even for me as someone who's working through what does faith really look like? What does, how does that play into politics and responsibility? And um, I, I think you address it in a way where you're not saying you know, throw out everything that you have and it's, it's completely pointless, but rather, why do you hold so strongly to A, B, or C? And I think for most people, uh, I always joke with guests, I'm like 105 episodes in now, and they'll say, you know, I'll ask, you know, how'd you get introduced to the movement? They'll say, oh, we were Christians before. And I was like, were you like a Christian or like an Amer a Christian, like every American's a Christian, you know? And yeah. a lot of times it's like, yeah, we just kind of went to church for like Christmas and Easter. And it's like, yeah. well, it's cultural, you know, it's purely mm -hmm. cultural. And there's a lot of people in the pew every Sunday who go every Sunday because they went every Sunday as a kid. Um, and so I, I appreciate you kind of pushing us a little bit deeper there. Um, mo moving into like, obviously we can talk about Vietnam and civil rights and people will say, well, that's a long time ago. Get over it. You know, um, we hear that time and time again with this, uh, with this current cycle, but uh, moving into modern evangelicalism, you know, you mentioned promise keepers in the nineties. We had masters men in the independent Baptist church because promise keepers was too liberal. Uh, that kind of doubled down. This was back when promise keepers was really in its heyday. And uh, Brother Martins was burdened to have a conference that was an answer, a good fundamental biblical answer uh, to promise keepers. How did these conferences kind of change the evangelical narrative moving into the 21st century um, as we kind of move forward there? Yeah, conferences are, I think, an understudied uh, phenomenon in American yeah. Christianity and particularly in American evangelicalism. And I mean, the question of what is evangelicalism was uh, a, r one of the central problems of this book. And without, to get, without getting too thick into the weeds, I'll just say that um, I, I came to see it was, it was 
a, a series of networks and alliances, really. Mm -hmm. And that conferences played a, a pretty critical role in shaping some of those networks and alliances. And then it's also a culture of consumption, a consumer culture that, that moves and kind of distributes goods across these, these channels, these distribution networks. Uh, so yes, conferences um, just came to fascinate me. And so my student research assistants and I had all these pages of, uh, or big sheets of butcher paper in my office. And we had sticky notes that had, you know, the gospel coalition and uh, different, you know, together for the gospel. And then the SBC and Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And we had all these Sharpie lines connecting them and different people. And I mean, that to me is, is American evangelicalism, understanding these networks and who fits with whom and, and then who is on the out, who is excluded from, from this company. Uh, and so Promise Keepers, I mean, it was this, this really critical uh, moment in, in the history that I tell, but not necessarily in the ways that you might think. The 1990s were fascinating to me. Um, because it was different than what came before and different than what would come after. The Cold War had come to an end, right, at the beginning of the, the decade. And so all of these certainties that made a ton of sense in Cold War framework were up for grabs, right? right? Militarism, well, who's our enemy? What, what are we doing now? And we had Bill Clinton in the White House, so what do you do with that? You know, he's our commander in chief. And, uh, uh, you know, is feminism, it seems like it's here to stay. Women are in the workforce. Maybe we need, maybe we need to rethink things. Culture wars, politics, I don't know. Maybe we need to look globally and think about the global church. And maybe we need a new idea of masculinity. And maybe we need to, we just, we, we need to re rethink these. So the, the word of the day was confusion. There was so much confusion uh, when you read the literature of Christian masculinity in the 1990s because the old certainties were gone. Uh, and so the answers were not uniform. Some men within the movement, some leaders were suggesting that, no, it's time for a, a change. We need a, a, an updated masculinity. Forget this old macho masculinity, right? That's, that's so Cold War era and we need something new. We need a kinder, gentler, softer patriarchy. So soft patriarchy was a catchword. And within the evangelical men's movement, we also have um, this motif of the tender warrior that really takes hold. So yes, we, we still want warriors, but we need the tenderness. We really need the tenderness. And, um, and so that, that really, you know, the, the, the Promise Keepers movement drew millions of men into this movement who are all asking these questions and they were getting a variety of different answers. Um, by the end of the decade, we see a, the pendulum swinging back, forget the, the softness, forget the tenderness, we don't want that anymore. And, and that's where we kind of go into the 21st century, kind of back with this, this, this return to a militant patriarchal um, understanding of Christian masculinity that then becomes um, very popular uh, in the next decade. We need hard preaching. We need preaching that will rebuke sharply. We don't need any more delicate preachers. We don't need any more effeminate, pink lemonade drinkers, ear ticklers, back scratchers, foot massagers, skinny jeans wearers, Joel Austin brothers. Hillary Clinton followers, Oprah Winfrey viewers, Lazy Boy sitters, crowd pleasers, Instagrammers, YouTube influencers, and Christ denying preachers. Why? Because hard preaching keeps your faith healthy. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Uh, but the 1990s, again, are, are this, this, this moment. And one of the things that it does, uh, that the Promise Keepers movement does, is it creates this vast market. Uh, because when you have millions of Christian men, not just going to a conference, but joining men's groups in their churches because their churches are starting up men's groups. Because yes, if you don't like promise keepers, you need your own. Yeah. Catholic churches are starting Catholic men's groups uh, and uh, local churches starting their own versions, whether they go to promise keepers or whichever conference. So you have the proliferation of conferences. You also have this huge boom in Christian publishing 
books for men, right? And so John Eldridge as well, that heart is one of those. Uh, but there are it just, and, and that goes on to sell more than 4 million copies. And then that in, in and of itself generates this whole cottage industry of copycat books. And, and so uh, I, I just thinking in terms of market, right? <laughs> of, of, um, of, you know, how can you reach people with these new ideas? And Promise Keepers is just really critical to start the, the men's movement, to really get it up and running, to start men's groups, to really start, you know, publishing, Christian publishing for men, marketed to men. And, and that, we, we're still living with that today. Right. Yeah, I, I want to be respectful of your time, um, but I'm curious now, I, I, like you said, there was a big swi- uh, switch that's happened and that tender warrior period was pretty short lived, I feel. Um, and I think probably a lot of that could could be put toward, you know, like I mentioned, 9-11 and, you know, there was a lot of things culturally that that created these shifts. Um, and obviously, recently, a lot of conversations about, you know, like I said, it's echo what happened, you know, several decades ago. Um, but I, I'm fascinated as someone who, you know, I went out of the independent Baptist movement directly into, you know, feet first into the young restless reform movement. And, you know, and then pretty much was like, oh, this is kind of the same thing, but with different theology. Um, but now I'm seeing people like Eric Metaxas, uh, Owen Strachan, um, you know, Douglas Wilson, uh, guys who, you know, I was reading, consuming content from who were already like, I would just say, oh, well, they're a little bit more conservative than I am, but like their theology is kind of, you know, fine. And, you know, then you'd have Jeff Durbin with Apologia and and they're kind of doing their own thing in Arizona. Um, Even MacArthur, like all of those guys, I would just say, oh, they were more conservative, but I I read them, eat the meat, spell the bones kind of thing. But now, like in the last, like reading Eric Metaxas's Twitter feed and going like, who, what happened? Like, how did you go from like, you know, questionable historian and like theologian to like radical, you know, radical, uh, yeah, radical is the, is the right term. Um, so I guess what, who would you say are the most prominent voices right now as you're looking at the, the, the next 10 years and you're looking at, you know, what book am I going to be writing in 10 years about how this has developed? Uh, who do you think are the big movers and shakers we should be watching? And what do you think is going to happen next? Are we going to see another, you know, reversion back to kind of this, this calmer, tender evangelicalism, or do you think it's just going to keep, are we in uncharted territory at this point? Oh, we are in uncharted territory. I, I mean, as a historian, I am, uh, <laughs> I, I'm extremely reluctant to predict the future because it, just looking at the past, all of the unexpected twists and turns that, you know, yeah. it, it, it's humbling. Uh, I have no idea where we're going next, but um, what I would, I, I would say a couple of things. One, I, you know, this idea of uh, you, you recounting your own experience of, okay, sure, he's a little bit more conservative or, you know, yes, you know, I, I wouldn't go that far, but that's exactly the mentality I think that has brought us to where we are, um, that the um, kind of conservative and often fundamentalist forces within uh, the broader evangelical movement have been powerful. And uh, many more moderate individuals have um, effectively allied with them by saying, okay, well, we wouldn't go maybe quite as far, but there still is this perception that, you know, that they're, they're still, you know, really upholding Orthodox Christianity and biblical truth. And so this language of brother in Christ kept popping up. You know, I heard that so much as I was listening in on these conversations. Oh, this is my brother in Christ. And yes, you know, we may not accept everything, but he is our brother in Christ. And then, you know, guess what? Christianity Today will invite, you know, Doug Wilson into their spaces and prop up his authority. Or John Piper will defend, uh, right, Wilson against, you know, uh, allegations of racism. And, and I just became fascinated with these alliances between the more extreme uh, fundamentalists and often racist or misogynistic um, uh, corners of evangelicalism and the purported mainstream respectable yeah. powers. And I think that's where we are today uh, or, or gets us to where we are today, where you have a lot of people who would define themselves as moderate evangelicals. I'm not as conservative as, you know, fill in the blank, but they feel constrained by um, 
the power of conservative evangelicalism, and not just by individual leaders, but conservative evangelicalism is largely a populist movement, which means no one leader is all that important. Yeah. And a leader only has power if they kind of get out in front of this populist movement. Mm -hmm. If they try to redirect, they're quickly abandoned on the side of the road. Yeah. Uh, right. And so that's what, um, folks at Christianity Today, I think, have come to realize or are coming to realize that they are not quite the leaders of evangelicalism that they long assumed they were. Um, maybe there's a question of them squandering some of that leadership earlier when they could have, have used, uh, used that to certain ends. And now they realize that they, they might consider themselves leaders, but they have far fewer followers than they ever anticipated. Mm. Um, and this respectable mainstream evangelicalism, I think, is at a loss right now. Um, at the same time, right, boundaries were drawn and certain people were defined outside of the fold. Uh, so people like Rob Bell, people like Rachel Held Evans or Jen Hatmaker, who identified as evangelical, wanted to stay inside and because of views on gender or sexuality or hell, very, very quickly and kind of permanently um, outed. Yeah. Um, so to me, the, the, this project was in some ways just understanding the boundary drawing. Uh, where were those boundaries drawn over time and who had the power to draw them and to enforce them? And, uh, and that's where we get into interesting questions about the relationship of the mainstream to the extremes. Right. Yeah. It's, I think what you said is really interesting. You know, the people get, people that think they have influence get cast aside. I've seen that happen with so many leaders. I mean, John Piper was, um, went from being, you know, um, and John Piper is, I mean, regardless of views on him, fairly consistent with his, with his viewpoints. And one of the people that I was holding my breath to see if this would be where he changes his tune, because MacArthur definitely changed from the last election yeah. to this election. And I'm not just specifically referring to Trump, but just rhetoric in general, yes. like doubling yes. down. Uh, MacArthur doubled down very heavily on, you know, the statements he made to Beth, Beth Moore, you know, um, the statements made. And, um, but like someone like John Piper, just by saying that Christians don't need, are, aren't sinning if they don't vote, like they don't need to, if they feel morally wrong about voting, don't do it. He lost a ton of support from ma mainstream evangelicals who would have said, you know, before them would have been like, oh yeah, Piper's amazing, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's, it's just really fascinating seeing that. And um, yeah, I, I'm curious. We are in uncharted territory. I'm curious to see where things go, but I, I think that understanding, you know, as a historian, understanding the history is the best way to be able to process what's happening currently and, and what we see coming our way. Um, so I, I really appreciate your book. And uh, like I said, I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I, if, if anyone enjoyed this conversation, like you need to pick up a copy of this. It, it was, it was incredibly helpful to me and I'm reading it saying like, oh, all of this is not about 1950s, 60s, 70s, like we're seeing this play out right now. And it's much bigger than a candidate. It's much bigger than one election. Like this is how we actually process our faith. And I think this is a really important book on that subject. So. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate this conversation. Awesome. Uh, just, just one last thing. What's, what's next for you? Is it, is it just kind of waiting? And cause I, I know obviously like I want people to pick up the book, but are you, considering like kind of uh, amending. I, I actually think you were, wrote that you were adding some stuff to this. Due to I did. The I did. I just finished the copy edits on it uh, this afternoon, actually. Oh, so, uh, well, it's, it's, it's just a small edition. So the paperback of Jesus and John Wayne will be out in June. And uh, so they asked me to write a preface uh, to the paperback edition that kind of brings us up through 2020 because a few things happened in 2020. And couple, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was a fun exercise. And it was a very quick turnaround because I said, you cannot ask me to write this preface before the 2020 election <laughs> results right. are in. And so, um, so I, I had a quick turnaround with that. And yeah, you know, I did not, uh, when I finished the book uh, a year and a half ago now, uh, and turned it into my publisher, I did not see, you know, global pandemic on the horizon, right. nor could I have imagined exactly what that would bring to the surface, right, with respect to conversations about masculinity and militancy and evangelicalism. 
uh, and, uh, and again, and then the Black Lives Matter movement. So that is included as well. And, and then the, the election results also, um, which uh, really, um, as you suggested, this, this history suggests that this has been going on for a long time. This is not just about one candidate, although Trump was in many ways kind of the perfect candidate at the perfect moment right. uh, to kind of crystallize this movement. But the movement itself is not going anywhere. It's not like Likely to go anywhere, uh, even when when he leaves office, and so so that's really what I was just uh, thinking through. And it's all it's all in the new preface um, that will be out in the summer. Who knows what's going to happen between now and June? Of course, yeah, preface part uh, two. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This yeah. is the kind of book that you just yeah. I will yeah. say though, you know, having finished the manuscript uh, a year and a half ago. And then, and then there's this long kind of waiting, you know, production period and just watching things play out and then watching kind of 2020 come around and, 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 and everything that that entails it, I will say the thesis held up very well in, in the meantime, but it, it's <laughs> I'd not, say so. not diminished in significance. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I'm, at, I am actually starting a next project and it's not quite public yet, but uh, what I can say is it is. Uh, it will soon be public. We're just just signing papers at this point. Uh, it will be looking at, you can kind of think of it as Jesus and John Wayne, but for the girls. So it's okay. looking much more closely at a cultural history of white Christian womanhood hmm. uh, for the last uh, half century or so. Wow. Yeah. I can't wait to check that out as well. And, you know, like I said, this has been an amazing book and a great conversation and I'll, uh, I'll be eagerly awaiting uh, whatever comes out next. I actually need to go back and read your first book as well. So uh, I'm excited to check that out, check that out. But uh, thank you so much for taking time to do this. I know you've got quite a bit to, to get done tonight, but I appreciate you taking the time for this conversation and to uh, discuss the book. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.